Okay, I think we're ready to start. And um, it is a great pleasure, but mostly it's a great honor to introduce Christopher Austin, the director of the National Center for Advancing Translational Science, Sciences, known as an NCATS of the NIHS. Chris leads the center's work to improve the translation of observation in the laboratory, clinic, and community into the interventions to reach and benefit patients from diagnostics to therapeutics to medical procedures and behavioral changes. Under his direction, the NCAT researchers and collaborators are developing new technologies, resources, collaborative research models, demonstrating the usefulness and, and disseminating the data analysis and methodologies for use by world, uh, worldwide research community. I'm actually lucky my laboratory is collaborating with, um, with uh, NCATS for a number of years now. Uh, so Chris Austin has spanned the spectrum of translational research in the public and private uh, sections. Uh, he joined NIH at um, 2002 as the senior advisor to the director uh, for the translation at the National Human Genome Research Institute, where he was responsible for conceptualizing and implementing research programs to derive scientific insights and therapeutic benefits from the newly completed Human Genome Project. While at uh, NHGRI, he funded, he founded and directed the NIH Chemical Genomics Center, the therapeutic, um, Therapeutics for Rare and Neglected Disease Program, the TOX21 uh, Century Initiative, and the NIH Center for Translational Therapeutics. So you can see his vision about developing therapeutics is great. Upon creation of the NCATS in 2011, he became an inaugural director of the NCATS division of the Preclinical Innovation, and he was appointing, appointed as the NCATS director in 2012. Prior to joining NIH, uh, Chris was uh, worked at the pharmaceutical company Merck, where he directed programs on genome-based um, discovery of novel uh, targets and drugs, with particular focus on schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease. Chris Austin is trained both as a clinician as geneticist. He trained in internal medicine and neurology at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and practiced medicine in academic and community hospital settings as well as in an urban primary care and in rural Alaska and Africa. He completed a research fellowship in developmental neurogenetics at Harvard, studied genetic and environmental influence on stem cell fate determination. Chris Austin has earned an MD from Harvard Medical School and also a AB uh, summa cum laude in biology, laude in biology from uh, Princeton University. And Chris is going to talk to us today. The title of his presentation is Catalyzing Translational Innovation. Chris, thank you very much for coming. <coughs> so, Thanks for coming, and thanks to uh, Vasilis and the Cancer Center for inviting me. The, the, I left off the the, um, <clears throat> the major part of my resume, and, and why I'm, uh, I count myself as successful is that I was uh, I was an intern with Tom Lynch uh, at the Mass General, and um <clears throat> so I'm still laughing about a number of the jokes that uh, that Tom uh, used to uh, say. And um, I know he's he's gone back uh, to uh, to uh, Mother Harvard, um, but I'm I'm sure he left you in good good stead. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do today is is go through pretty rapidly uh, both what the vision is for this relatively new center. It's only been around about four years. I've been director about three. Um, explain to you a little bit about how we think about translation, um, and and I give you some examples. Um, one of the things I want you to uh, keep in mind is that we're a different kind of place. Everything we do is a, is a collaboration with somebody. Um, the way that I got here was via a, a collaboration with Facilis. As he said, we've been collaborating um, <clears throat> for a number of years now. Um, and so if there are things that um, uh, you think we're doing that would be of, of, of uh, interest to you, then I hope you'll uh, let me know or get on the website and, um, uh, and find the right people because we're, um, we're uh, um, we consider translation a team sport, and uh, we really act that way. So, so um, I'm sometimes asked to explain why NCATS was formed by the NIH. It's actually the first 
uh, institute or center at NIH ever formed for a scientific reason. It's interesting, a little factoid. Um, and, and the reason is, is, is this fact that, that we live with every day, which is that we live in a, a painfully a bittersweet time, really, where we know more about ourselves and health and disease than we ever have. But, uh, uh, but, but those, the, the epical changes that have happened in science and medicine here, perhaps exemplified by the Human Genome Project, but, 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 but in all areas of biology, really, uh, have not been mirrored by epical changes in health improvement. And, you know, if you, if you think how different science is now from when I was in training 30 years ago and think about how different uh, therapeutics is, particularly in my own field of neurology, <clears throat> 30 years ago, they're, they're, they're not even comparable. So why is that? Um, it, well, I'm going to argue that, that it's because we just don't understand very well how to go from this side to this side. So the purpose of NCATS is to figure that out. And, and, and there are all kinds of knock-on effects of this. Uh, we're all aware of the problems in the drug device uh, industry, the clinical trial system. I say uh, it's inefficient here is uh, Rob Califf, who is the, now the um, new um, uh, commissioner designated at the FDA, he likes to say it's, uh, it's a mess as he likes to say, uh, and it really is. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and even when, um, uh, when uh, interventions are shown to be useful, uh, it takes a very long time for all the patients who can benefit from them to actually get them. So, so as a result, people are unhealthier than they should be, and funders are, are uh, impatient uh, with us, um, partially because they don't understand this process, but, but partially because we just don't understand how to deliver on the promise. Um, now, the good part of this uh, is, is this, is, is this partially um, uh, sort of um, uh, instantiated in this uh, graph, which uh, is going to show you the, uh, the trend line of the number of human conditions with, the, with a known molecular basis. This is a known uh, molecular basis in OMIM, online inheritance in man. And um, <clears throat> I, I always have to ask, what, if, very few people ever get this when I, when I visit, but uh, does anybody know what the first, the, the, the first disease, the molecular basis of which was determined? Ah, very good. The deputy director gets the <laughs> That's good. Uh, okay, you get extra points for knowing when and who. Minus Pauling. Ah, that's good. Minus Pauling. 49. Close. That's, as, that's closer than, than anybody has gotten before. That's, I should have come to Yale before. Um, yeah, so, so uh, Linus Paul in 1949, um, ask yourselves, is, the, is there a drug against sickle cell on the, that was developed on the basis of that molecular understanding? The answer is no, um, still, 66 years later. Um, so certainly just having the gene uh, isn't going to uh, um, inevitably lead to a drug. But, but then uh, down here um, in uh, 1989, 60 fibrosis, 1991 is Huntington's. And then after uh, large amounts of sequence data started getting put into human, into uh, uh, GenBank as part of the Genome Project, that's really when this uh, took off. And the number now is well over 5,500. Uh, so vastly different than when I was uh, in training back in the early uh, 80s. The, the, the downside, however, of course, of all this is that there's only about 500 that have any treatment. Now, some of this is, uh, is, a, is a time lag. You all know that the current numbers, I hope, are burned into your brain in order to make a drug out of a target. Currently takes about 15 years. Uh, costs, depending on how you do the math, between 2 and $10 billion um, and fails well over 95% of the time. And, and so, but, but so some of this is a time delay, but I actually have looked at uh, the number of diseases uh, that have gone from untreatable to treatable every year from uh, the, the drugs that get approved at FEA every year. And that number is staying constant. It's about three a year. And so another number to stick in your head is uh, to realize why we have to do things differently is that uh, there are about 6,000 untreatable human diseases. We're getting about three of them uh, taken care of every year. That means that at the current rate of progress, it's going to be 2,000 years before every human disease is treatable. And I, and, and I would propose to you that's just simply not an acceptable answer. Uh, but what it tells you is that we can't do this be a brute force approach. We can't put 2,000 times as much money or 2,000 times as many, as many people. We've got to think about how to do this smarter. Um, and the answer to this is, is science, I believe.
So um, before I go on to tell you what we're doing, I, what, uh, I'll tell you what translation is. So people use this term in all kinds of ways. I find that it's a real uh, albatross uh, in many ways. We're kind of stuck with it, I'm afraid. But, um, but you, you all would appreciate this. After I became director about three years ago, I was down in, on Capitol Hill trying to explain uh, what this new center does. And, uh, and, and they said, well, <clears throat> OK, so we had the director of the National Cancer Institute in here a couple of weeks ago, and we, don't, we, we know what cancer is. Um, everybody knows what cancer is. Um, and, and then we had the director of the National Eye Institute in, and I don't understand how eyeballs work, but you know, even congressmen have eyeballs. Most of them even have two. Um, and so they understand intuitively what that institute does. Now, you're the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. And this guy looks at me and says, uh, so what, you, do, you do linguistics? Is that what you do? Translation, right? Because that's to normal people, that's what translation means. And I had somebody at NIH say, you know, you have an entire center that's devoted to how mRNA gets made into protein? That's a really specific center. And, you know, so we're stuck with this word. So how do we use the term? How we use the term is this. It's the whole process by which you take an observation that happens in the lab, a scientist makes in the lab, a doc makes in the clinic, or a public health worker makes in the community, where a light bulb goes off and, and they say, aha, what I'm looking at is a fundamental principle of this system that explains why something went wrong and might be the basis of a treatment. It, the whole process from that, when that light bulb goes off to creating the, the intervention, the drug, the physical substance, the device, the behavioral intervention, uh, and, and then showing that it's actually safe and effective in animals and it's safe and effective in people in clinical trials and then as a friend of mine likes to say in free range humans uh, you know, out, in the, out in the community um, uh, outside of a clinical trial, that whole process of, of is, is what we call translation. But, but you'll notice that, um, that, that we are not the National Center for Translation. Virtually every center and institute at NIH um, uh, and and uh, every pharmaceutical company does translation by this definition, or at least parts of it. We're the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. So that tells you two things. One is that we are really particular about advancing. We're the only center or institute at, at NIH with a verb in the name, advancing, and we take that really seriously. So we're, we're big on measuring metrics, how we know we're actually advancing. And the second thing is that we're advancing translational science. So what the heck is translational science? Well, translational defines is, we define as the field of investigation which seeks to understand what the general principles are by which the translational process happens. And one of the things that, that, uh, that, that, um, that really strikes anybody who gets into this field, no matter what stage of the translational process they're in, is that it is almost relentlessly empirical trial and error. We don't understand what the underlying scientific and organizational principles at virtually any stage of this process. And when you, you imagine, when you realize that it's an empirical process, uh, because we don't understand what the general principles are, and realize that this is a process of increasing degrees of freedom, right, from, from going from a, a, a protein in a tube to a person in the community. The number of degrees of freedom goes up dramatically. So what is the likelihood of your getting to the end successfully if you're taking a trial and error approach? The answer is virtually nil, the chances of getting to the end, which is exactly what you observe. It's exactly what you would expect to observe. So the only way that we're going to take this process from being essentially gambling, which is what it is now, because you're just guessing for the most part, and I can say as a practitioner of this for the last 20 years, that's really what we do most of the time. We convince ourselves that we know what we're doing, but for the most part, we really don't understand what the principles are. Um, and and, and, and to, to understand what those general principles are is the only way that we're going to understand how to do this better. But it's not only a scientific problem, it's an organizational problem. So, so here's the mission. Uh, uh, I'm not going to read you the whole thing because you can read it, but, but uh, I want to emphasize this word, catalyze. A catalyst is, is a uh, reagent, as you all know, that brings together reactants uh, that are inert by themselves, but brings them together and allows them to produce a product that they otherwise wouldn't. Um, so a catalyst is a collaborator, and everything NCATS does is a collaboration. What are we, collabor what are we catal catalytic of? Novel ways of doing things to make the translational process process better, faster, cheaper. And as we like to say, get more treatments to more patients more quickly. That's really what we're all about. 
And from the very beginning, um, NCAS has been viewed as kind of a horse of a different color here as uh, um, one of my favorite organizational charts of the NIH. Uh, these are all of the uh, 27 different institutes in the billiard ball model of uh, organizations. Um, and you'll notice that, that NCAS um, is, is viewed as, as both a different color here, but also connected to all the institutes. Uh, and, and again, everything we do is collaboration is a collaboration with some with another institute or center or, or uh, organization outside of the NIH family. Family. And because of the, the place that we occupy in the, uh, in the biomedical research uh, ecosystem, uh, we, we have more regular and robust uh, interactions, not only with our colleagues in academia, but with disease advocacy groups, nonprofits, government agencies like EPA and FDA, pharma, biotech, VC, et cetera. Um, so it's a, it's a, but it's a, a collaborative engine. That's how it was defined. And, and so sometimes uh, when, when people realize, okay, I understand the problem, I understand what you're trying to do here, but you know, what do you guys do on Monday morning? You know, what do you, what do you just come in and think great thoughts about how to improve these processes? Well, well we don't. This is our um, this is our problem list. Um, so if you think about the the fact that our disease, we don't have cancer, we don't have eye disease, we don't have neurological disease. Our disease is the system, the translational system. That's our disease. That's what we study. What is the problem list of the translational patient, right? So you all, those of your doctors know that you know you have problem list: high blood pressure, diabetes, two previous strokes, and a hangnail, right? That's your problem list for for Mrs. Jones when she comes in to see you. These are all the problems of the translational process, and 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 so the first three are the the big three reasons that drugs fail before they get into people. All the rest of these uh, are either in clinical uh, trial applications or or in the in uh, in the community. But I want you to notice here that <clears throat> there's not a disease name in any of these. And the reason for that is that these translational problems are the same whether you're working on cancer, diabetes, or skin disease. They're all the same. And, and so one of the reasons that these are, remain such big problems is they fit into what economists would call the tragedy of the commons. I don't know if you know this, this uh, principle, it's the principle that, that, that problems which are everyone's problem in general, but nobody's problem in particular, don't tend to get worked on because everybody says it's not their problem, it's somebody else's problem. The classic example in, in, in economics is clean water, clean air. Yeah, it's a great example. These are all tragedy of the commons problems. So, so is this the, the NIH, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Cancer Institute's job uh, to, to, to solve this problem for all diseases, or the Neurological Institute's job to figure out this problem for all diseases? Well, the answer is no. But it is NCAT's job. But there's never been a part of NCAT's, a part of NIH to do this uh, before. These are the scientific problems. There's a lot of operational problems, which I was, we were having some good conversations earlier about some of these. If you think about what translation means, translation literally means trans, translatus, to carry across in Greek. That's what that means. And, uh, and, and so translation, by its definition, means you are carrying a discovery uh, away from your tribe Whatever you're trying to say, we all the scientists, we all have tribes. You know, so I'm a, I'm, an, I'm in the neurology tribe or guild, uh, and, and I'm in the genetics tribe. Uh, and I speak genetics and I speak neurology, um, but I don't speak um, informatics, for instance. And and most science is organized around little cliques, right? We talk to the same group of people and we speak our own little idiosyncratic languages, but we don't really worry about translating it, having it be relevant to someone else. You can't do translation with that point of view. You have to have an outwardly looking point of view because you're going to be transferring it to someone else. So that means issues of trade data transparency and release are, are unavoidable. IP management is a big thing. Integration of project management. If you've got a whole team of 10, 20 people working on a project, uh, you've got to have project management. How do you give credit for team science? This is something I know you deal with every single day. It's a big problem. The biggest problem are in the informatics people and the statisticians. You know, where do they, how, how do you get those people, uh, the critical people, but how do you get them uh, a credit if they're middle authors on every, on every, uh, um, on every uh, publication? And these are things that all of us run into every day. Uh, interestingly, in most places, most academic places, um, if you get a paper and sell, you'll get tenure. If you have, if you make a great impact on the health of, uh, of the health system, for instance, via an intervention, you won't. So it's very interesting. Um, and I don't know if that's the way it is at Yale, but at most places it is. It's interesting. Uh, education and training, I'll, I'll come back to in a second, and, and collaborative structures. So 
uh, so that's what we do. How do we do it? Well, we're organized, not surprisingly, into clinical, preclinical, and, and sort of broad reengineering. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of these, but these are all the programs uh, within uh, within within NCATS, and there we actually have a really nice website now. You can see all of the different programs. Um, I'm going to start in the clinical, and I'm going to work backwards. Um, this is the biggest part of the program of NCATS. It's a, uh, it's something called the CTSA program. You have one uh, here at Yale. Um, it's a national consortium of medical research institutions that grew out of the GCRC program, if anybody remembers that, back from the 60s and 70s. Uh, and its purpose is to work on the lower part of that problem list that I showed you before, uh, improves the way the clinical and translational research is conducted uh, nationwide, accelerates the research process in the clinical domain, and, and does a lot of innovative training. Uh, these are the sites. Um, uh, in case you got lost on the way to work, you are uh, you're over you're over here someplace. You got you got um, uh, as I suppose is often the case. You you got mixed in with that morula that's around uh, around New York. Um, but uh, but you you have a dot there, um, but but what I want you to notice about here is that there's, there's six, about 60 of these places, and there are many of the of the well-known academic medical centers. And when I took this program over, I looked at this and I thought, wow, this imagine if we could tie all of these places together with a common electronic health record structure, a common IRB structure, a common contracting structure, a common way to find patients, to find key opinion leaders, to find experts in whatever disease. There's 130 million people taken care of across this network uh, or across the, all of these centers. Um, uh, virtually experts in virtually every area of biology and disease in one of these places, but they've, but they've traditionally worked separately. So what we're doing is to tie them together, uh, n n not to eliminate their individual strengths, but to tie them together, w allow them to work as, as a team to get things uh, done that they can't do alone. And, and, and some of the things we're doing um, uh, are some of these. So uh, uh, two of the biggest problems in, uh, in getting clinical studies done are, uh, are, are um, um, multiple site reviews of uh, institutional review board uh, is the review board. So let's say you have, um, uh, you want to do a clinical study in 20 places, uh, a, an institutional review board at each of those 20 places and the lawyers thereof have to sign off on it. That can take literally a year or two years. And so patients waiting for a clinical trial will either get so sick that they're no longer eligible or they will die waiting for the clinical trial because we can't get our act together to get the IRB review done. And it's very clear that these multiplicity of reviews doesn't add safety, actually. Um, and it's just, that is a completely solvable problem. Why has it not been solved? It's been solved the NCI, right? Because the NCI was able to say, we're going to have a central IRB. But, but we couldn't do that within this program because we have so many diseases that we just no way to do a central IRB. So we're putting together a, a, a nationwide IRB reliance agreement to have a single IRB for all. Uh, same thing with budgeting, contracting, um, and, and we're going to have uh, these centers which will they'll do this as part of the CTSA program. <laughs> Um, another big problem that, that I'm sure many of you are aware of is that uh, the vast, uh, uh, actually the majority of clinical trials funded by NIH uh, fail, <clears throat> not because the hypothesis was not true, that would be a negative trial. They fail because they, they, they do not uh, recruit enough patients to be able to get a statistically significant result. So you've wasted patients' time, exposed them to uh, uh, interventions with no chance of benefit. You've wasted institutional time, researcher time, uh, and, 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 and patients don't benefit and, and researchers don't either. Um, in the age of Facebook, this is a solvable problem. Right? I mean, look, look at the, the ice bucket challenge, right? I mean, look how fast that happened. It's very possible to find people. This is a cultural problem. It's not a technical problem. And so we're putting together, and about halfway along the line of doing this now, too, to create a structure where you're going to be able to go across all those 130 million people and identify all the people who have uh, Menke's disease or whatever uh, rare disease or common disease you might be looking for uh, to qualify them for a clinical trial. Um, uh, th this will be absolutely transformational uh, for our ability to do clinical studies. Uh, in the, the, the training uh, piece, you know, the translation, to do translational science well requires 
training that's different from at least how I was trained. You know, I was trained as a as as a as a developmental neurogeneticist. You heard Vasilis say that. Uh, so I, I I worked in a very narrow area of science. I went to the neuroscience meeting every year. Same, talked to the same hundred people. Uh, we all published in the same journals. We all knew each other. Um, uh, and uh, but but I didn't know very much about the other fields of, of science. And to be a good translationalist, you have to be multilingual. Trans, uh, 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 scientifically multilingual. You have to understand uh, multiple different uh, disciplines. You have to understand not only their languages, but their, but their values, their culture, their history. It's just like learning a foreign language. You have, to, you have to understand all those things in order to be a good translationalist. And so in order to do this, there's some non-traditional areas like regulatory science or entrepreneurship that we need to train uh, folks in. Uh, we're uh, well along in having externships uh, in industry, foundations, the FDA, et cetera. The analogy I often use here is if you're learning a foreign language, you don't just sit in a classroom and learn the language. You go do a study abroad. You live in the country and you learn their word use, vernacular, cultural history. Then you're able to be a good translationalist. But, but now we expect, we have people sitting in an academic place learning about those people in pharma or those people at the FDA, but you don't understand it until you actually go work there. And, and that'll be part of our training as well. Um, and this, this is an interesting one at the bottom. You know, I talked to a lot of trainees about how you make a living in an academic place doing translational science. And, and this is one of my long-term uh, goals uh, is to make uh, translational research, translational science, uh, a, 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 a well-respected academic discipline the same way as biochemistry and genetics are, uh, and therefore it's a viable and even attractive uh, uh, career path, because otherwise we're not going to, this, this process is not going to be sustainable. So what we're doing with the CTSA, just to finish up here, is, is we're, um, we're creating these 60, we have these 60 hubs connected with these trial innovation centers, the recruitment innovation centers, so that multi-site studies will be uh, funded by NIH or uh, foundations or farmers or whoever uh, uh, in a just-in-time way uh, without uh, rebuilding the, the, the trial components every time. The concept here is that you ought to be able to, if you're a sponsor, you know, you're, you're the NCI or the NDS or whatever, and you don't want to go to the cancer centers, for instance, you ought to be able to plug into the CTSA program uh, like you plug into a supercomputer with your USB port, and you, you know how you plug in a peripheral, and, 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 the, and the computer recognizes what the peripheral is. That's the way the CTSA program ought to work. Um, and, and I would say we're about halfway there. Another year or two we'll be there, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced. Um, we have another um, uh, clinical program, which is really uh, complementary to what I just showed you. Um, this, this is the Big Bang diagram of something called the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. Um, it's focused, as its name implies, on rare diseases. Um, uh, there's one that's co-funded by cancer over here. Uh, most of them are co-funded by some of the NIH institutes, but I want you to notice a couple of things about this because they're, they're relevant to, to, the, to the translational discipline. That is, you see all these, these ovals here that say PAG on them. That means patient advocacy group. So in order to get funded uh, as one of these uh, consortia, you have to have a patient group as, as a research partner. Um, and who's, who's there from the very beginning helping you determine what the, what, the, what the research agenda ought to be, how the trials are going to be done, et cetera. And this has been absolutely critical in the, uh, in the, the uh, effectiveness of this program in, uh, in focusing the work that they do and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and connecting them to the patients that are needed. Um, the other thing I want you to notice here is that, um, that the diseases, uh, the, these, these consortia don't work on individual diseases. Right, so there's, there's 6,000 rare diseases, and we tend to think of them as individual puzzle pieces, but of course they're all related to each other in some way or another. And so in order to get funded as part of this uh, organization, you have to decide what is the biological organi organizing principle you're going to use to study a group of rare diseases and look at commonalities among them as a way to kill too many birds with one stone. Um, and you'll notice that some of them uh, have as that organization, organizing principle a, a biochemical pathway. Um, and there's the urea cycle is up here someplace oh, over here. Uh, urea cycle, biochemical pathway. Some uh, have uh, uh, an organelle like the mitochondria uh, or the lysosomes. Uh, some of them are uh, uh, an organ like uh, lung diseases. Uh, some of them are a, a, a particular kind of uh, kind of nerve cell uh, like uh, inherited peripheral neuropathy. Um, but but 
by studying 20 or 30 diseases at a time, um, the, these the insights which get made in one get get translated to others very quickly, and and that's that's been another lesson here, which has really um, uh, we're really now applying to other to other programs. Um, this is the uh, the one that's funded by the NCI. And see down here it says funded by. I can't read this, but fund, funded by the by NCATS and the NCI. So really interesting uh, program on uh, chronic grassroots host disease, um, which is um, uh, is co-managed actually by NCATS and, and NCI, and it illustrates how we do a lot of programs. Virtually all of our programs, we're we're generalists in, in translational science in all those areas that I showed you, but we can't possibly have expertise in all 7,000 diseases, and that's why we collaborate with with uh, disease experts, um, uh, institutes, or individual experts who have this disease expertise. Um, another program which illustrates a general principle we're, we're trying to solve is, uh, is, the, is this lemon, lemon to lemonade problem. <clears throat> this is something called the New Therapeutic Uses Program. Um, you may know that, that even when a drug is developed uh, over the course of often five or ten years and gets into people, 80% uh, of those drugs that get into people are never approved for a variety of reasons, either efficacy reasons, tox reasons, or business reasons. Uh, and so uh, the lemonade here, however, is when you think about these numbers, if, if only one out of five drugs gets approved, then for every drug approved, there's four drugs that have made it a long way through the development process. Uh, we've had tens or hundreds of millions of dollars spent on them, have been into people, and they're, they're not benefiting anybody because they were never approved, and they're not benefiting the company, they're non-performing assets from a, from a business standpoint. And so the concept was, could, could NCATS work as a catalyst to bring together the pharma companies that have these late stage uh, compounds that they don't know what to do with, and academic investigators have novel ideas about uh, to, to which these compounds might be put, uh, and, uh, and, and provide, uh, which we did, a kind of match.com uh, platform that allowed them to find each other in cyberspace. We provided money to allow the, the trials to be done. Uh, the companies brought in the asset, the, 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 the drug and the placebo and the, all the regulatory data that they generated, the academics brought in the ideas and the patients. Um, and uh, one of these, uh, though it's not a cancer application, uh, there, oh, sorry, there, there are two uh, uh, that came from Yale, not, not cancer applications, but uh, one of them is John Crystal um, in uh, a GLI-T1 antagonist for schizophrenia, uh, and the other uh, is Steve Stretmatter, who was um, a, uh, uh, a residency colleague of mine uh, at the MGH, uh, so it seems like I was a resident with everybody of importance, at least at Yale, um, and, um, and so here's the, here's the Steve story. Um, it's, it's a wonderful story that, that I think if you generalize this, and there's no reason this ought to be, because you think about this as a special case, you'll realize why I think the potential here is so huge. So, um, so this drug, AZD530, uh, sericatinib, is a sarcinase inhibitor initially developed by AstraZeneca for cancer. It was not very effective as a single agent, so it was deprioritized by AZ. Um, at, at the time when this program uh, uh, came out with its list of, uh, of compounds that were available, including this one from AZ, uh, Steve, uh, Steve's lab had found that, um, that a member of the sarcinase family, Finn, FYN, um, seems to be involved in the synaptic pathology that is induced by A-beta oligomers, which appear to be the main molecular bad actor in Alzheimer's disease. The idea being if you can inhibit Finn, also, uh, a beta would continue to be made, but the, but, but the synaptic pathology would not happen uh, because the, that signal transduction wouldn't happen. Now, normally, if Steve had had this idea, it would have taken 10 years to develop an assay, to do a screen, do all the med chem, all this stuff. But because of this compound had already been developed, we were within two months of this discovery, Steve's discovery, we were, he was able to get an award to do this and start testing in animals and start testing a phase 1B study in humans, because of course it had already been in humans. Um, and um, and uh, about a year later, uh, this uh, report came out. This is the press release from our website, but this is the animal neurology paper um, that, uh, that shows rather dramatic effects in the uh, APPPOS1 transgenic, sort of a, a standard model for, uh, for, for Alzheimer's disease, that blocking fin uh, both uh, evolve, revolve, resolves the behavioral deficits in these animals, but actually makes all the, all the brain pathology go away as well. Um, and, and we're now, 
there's now a phase uh, 2B trial going on uh, here at Yale. Um, it's, uh, it's a multi-site study, but it's, 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 uh, it's uh, headed by Chris Van Dyck, who's an investigator here at Yale. So the point being that we went from, uh, because of this program, uh, instead of it taking 10 or 15 years to get to this point, this all happened in a year and a half. <clears throat> but but this never would have happened in the old way of doing things. This requires a, a, a fundamental focus on teamwork and a different way of thinking about how to organize these these resources. Okay, so now I'm going to go back into uh, true uh, doing drugs, um, that is, uh, uh, drug development. Um, uh, for those of you who don't think about this every day, this is this is drug development and six easy steps. Um, remember that, that to go from this side to this side takes uh, currently the state of the art, if you want to call it that, is uh, takes 15 years, fails 98% eh, of the time, uh, and costs about let's call it five billion dollars. So uh, sometimes people say, well, gosh, you know, why don't you just let pharma do? You know, pharma's figured this out. Why don't you just let them do this? And I say, figure this out. It fails 99% of the time and costs 10 billion dollars. What are you, nuts? What are, that's, that is not, if and something that fails 98, 99% of the time cannot be called worked out, right? I mean, we, we, have to, we have to set our bar a little bit higher. And, and it's not because people in pharma are dumb. When I was at Merck, those people actually, I know this is hard to believe, but those people were, were smarter than the people at Harvard I've come from. Now, I know it's, that couldn't be smarter than the people at Yale, but they were smarter than the people at Harvard. It's, they are, but, but it's just there are, there are, if you don't understand what the general principles are, it doesn't matter how smart you are, uh, you're, you're going you're gonna to have great difficulty making headway. And, and so something I, I want you to just take away from this uh, in terms of, of what we're all engaged in now, because this is a, is, a, is, is a societal sort of social discussion that we have to have, so we have to realize what the, what the monetary stakes are. Uh, as you go from uh, a basic research discovery, um, say a gene or a pathway involved in a disease, to discovery of a small molecule probe, let's say that you could test in cells or animals to test your therapeutic hypothesis, to having a drug now, I'll call it a drug, which you can test in people in a phase one, phase two A trial, to having uh, clinical trials which are large enough to get FDA registration, the cost goes up by a log each time. So what you can get here for a graduate student, 100K a year, uh, that 100K to get a, 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 a probe compound will cost you a million. To get a drug which is uh, testable in people will cost you about 10 million. Uh, to register this depends on how big, the comp how big the population is, but it's about 100 million. So now imagine we at NIH and everybody, and you guys too, at the Cancer Center, you are um, uh, challenged to have more treatments get to patients as a result of the basic research you do, but we're in a flat budget, right? So now, for every project you do, which is going to get into people, which we all say, and I think appropriately, is, is one of the reasons we're here, you could, you could have 100 graduate students for the cost of one project. So I don't pretend to know what the right answer is here, but just realize those are the numbers, and, and we got to deal with those numbers and satisfy our own scientific and medical obligations, the, the Congress's obligation or, or require or requirements, um, and and continue doing the the basic researches of the seed corn for this whole thing. So. Um, of course, over the long term, the only way to solve this problem is to decrease these numbers, right? And so that's what, that's what NCAS is really focused on. The numbers, interestingly, are not driven by the unit cost. They're driven by the failure rate, right? So if you have to do something 10 or 100 times in order to be successful, you got to take the unit cost and multiply it by 1 over the failure rate. So if you decrease the failure rate, that's going to be the, 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 uh, uh, the, the key here. Uh, just, just to, to uh, <clears throat> get you totally depressed, and then I'll, I'll bring you back from this. Uh, you all know what Moore's Law is, I hope. Um, as a number of transistors you can fit on a microprocessor, that's increased linearly since uh, the early 70s, named after Gordon Moore, one of the founders of Intel. It's why you can have a supercomputer uh, in your iPhone uh, now. Uh, in, in drug development, oh, in drug development we have this, which is E-Room's Law. This is Moore's Law spelled backwards. Um, this is actually a real paper that you should read. It was in uh, Nature Review's Drug Discovery a couple years ago. 
This is a profoundly terrifying graph, uh, or, uh, which shows you a dramatically negative productivity growth in producing drugs over the last 60 years. What it's showing you is that since 1950, the number of drugs which have been approved per billion dollars spent has gone down in an absolutely monotonic way, such that, uh, such that the number of new drugs uh, approved per billion dollars spent has gone down by half every nine years since 1950. Now, any organization with this kind of dramatically negative productivity growth is either going to go out of business or they're going to have to raise their prices off the wall in order to stay in business. And that's exactly what you're seeing in pharma. And that's, that, this, isn't, this isn't a big surprise. This is why. But now imagine that this, this graph, if you, if, you, if you draw this out here, it goes to zero in 2050. So all of things being equal, unless something changes, there will be no new drugs after 2050. Or the cost of a new drug will be infinity, which is pretty much the same thing. And just imagine that this line has been immutable despite the invention of computers, recombinant DNA, gene therapy, you know, the birth of bacillus, you know, all these things which, which should have changed this line have not. And now NCAS has to solve this, has to turn this line. And, and I would argue, and do argue, that the problem here is that science has never been applied to this problem. Nobody has ever tried to figure out what the general principles are. And that's the only way we're going to turn this line. Okay, so how does NCATS approach this problem? Uh, we do it uh, via uh, having, um, uh, taking a, 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 a disruptively team-based approach to this problem. That is to say, there are lots of companies out there, Merck including, um, that are trying to be experts in some area of biology. And there are lots of really great biologists, mainly in academic centers, trying to, trying to make drugs. And, and, and in both cases, it's problematic. Sometimes it succeeds. But, but it's really hard to do both at the same time. Um, and, and so our concept was, well, you know, what you actually want is you want the academic investigator who knows more about this area of biology than anybody in the whole world has thought about it for 30 years don't try to make them into a drug developer. Team them up with people who really know how to do this uh, and, and put them on a joint project team and have them march forward together. And, and that's the whole model of how this process works. So depending on where you're stuck, and our collaborators get stuck at, every, at, at each of these places, they come into uh, one or another of these programs and they all come through peer review to get into these programs. And what comes out the bottom are these deliverables that are either a data and or a physical substance, a lead, an sRNA, a stem cell, a, a, a repurposed drug, whatever it is. Um, but, but they're all dual use projects, right? So they tell us something which will move this project forward the, for the individual investigator, but, but they also tell us something general that'll allow us to do it better the next time. One of the ways we can do this is that we've hired about 150 people and we've hired them, about 80% of them, from, uh, from biotech and pharma. But in order to get hired, remember, we don't tell them we want you to reproduce what pharma has. Because remember, the state of the art in pharma is terrible. And I say that with all love and affection for my former colleagues at Merck. It's not because they're dumb. It's because that is the state of the science. And it's very hard to work out the state of the science, the state of the, how to improve the state of the science in a short-term commercial imperative environment. So, so we take these people and we say, you've got to tell us what the state of the art is, but you have to tell us how to do it better. Because you don't have that short-term commercial imperative that you had when you were in, in a pharma. So this is the Chemical Genomics Center that Vasilis mentioned. This is the target to lead space. There's about 200 collaborations with investigators all over the world, who, people who have discovered novel targets for intervention, and they want to make a small molecule probe or a lead. Vasilis is one of those people. The focus is on the 95% of targets and diseases that biopharma doesn't work on. Um, they're both SIs and chemicals. We're, we spend a lot of time, it will not surprise you to learn, on new technologies to improve efficiency and sex, success rates. Uh, and, and over the long term, what we really want to understand is what are the general principles uh, by which SIs work and, and, and small molecule target interactions. I sometimes um, uh, say that, that, that the way this, this field is currently uh, uh, done uh, can, can be understood by, uh, by all of you because you're, you're, you're either geneticists or you have an understanding of this. It, it's, it, just imagine trying to do genetics if you didn't understand that A goes with T and G goes with C. Right? I mean, it's all second nature to us, right? But in 1950, this was not known. And, and, if, and if, if you didn't know that, 
genetics would be empirical. So if you're trying to make a PCR primer, you'd have to make 500,000 PCR primers and test them all. But you don't have to do that because you know what the physical chemistry is and you can calculate a TM, right? We can't do that here. And that's the, that's the, the source of the problem. Now that is a fantastic problem. Right? In my mind, just imagine where molecular biology was in 1950 and what's happened since then. I mean, this sort of getting in on the ground floor is pretty cool, so I hope a lot of you will do that. Um, I'm going to show you a really brief video um, to give you an idea of what we do. There's a whole slide, there's a whole video online, but this is the tickler, it's the trailer for the film. Yeah, so this is one of the resources that I hope you'll avail yourselves of, because remember, it is a collaborative resource. One of the other resources we put together uh, is this collection of, uh, of all approved drugs. Uh, it amazed us a few years ago when we were trying to make repurposing more systematic um, that, that a, I asked our informatics people to give me a complete number done at list of every drug approved for human use worldwide. And I thought somebody must have done that, right? Every drug approved for human use, somebody must have. Nobody had ever done it. And he's like, what do you mean nobody had ever done it? This was like the 2008, nobody had ever done it. Why? Because this, this is a tragedy of the commons problem. Um, and now it's been done, all the data is on our website, um, um, and this collection we use to do all kinds of things. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, uh, one of the things that we've done that I, I would, uh, uh, we found very helpful uh, is, is to have patients in addition to academics or, or, or researchers drive the science. So all three of these projects, this is a project on Charcuterie tooth disease, it's a rare neuropathy, uh, this on Chordoma, which is a rare uh, uh, cancer, uh, and this one on myotonic dystrophy, it's a rare uh, muscle disease. Each one of them started because of a, a, a patient or a mom who walked into my office and said, C can you work with us? And then that person or that parent nucleated the scientific team that the, we ended up working with. So it started with the patient, not with the scientist. And, and, and this has been tremendously productive for us. Uh, one of the uh, more recent examples, which I thought you'd find interesting, uh, is this one. So uh, using this collection, we collaborated with a guy named Jake Lang, who's a hepatologist at DK. Uh, you, know about, you know all about HCV and the new uh, treatments. Uh, this uh, project very rapidly identified this uh, very old uh, uh, antihistamine, uh, currently available only in Russia. It's never been approved uh, in this country uh, before. It's a very potent anti-HCV agent. Um, when we did all the target deconvolution, uh, all we know is that it doesn't hit any of the known targets, so it has a different mechanism, which makes us think that it will be um, uh, uh, complementary to Sovaldi and other um, uh, other therapies. Uh, and, and as a result of the fact that it was uh, already approved in another country, the FDA was allowed us to start a, a, a clinical trial uh, about, a, about six months after this discovery was made. And this kind of thing happens all the time. Uh, and I think there's a lot of room to run here. Uh, one I had to show you because of uh, our esteemed collaborator in the first row. Um, it, and, but I also show you this because it's, it's, a, it's a typical story, and I could show you 50 other stories like this. So back when Vasilis was in, um, uh, in uh, Colorado, uh, he came to us and he said, you know, uh, there, there's, this, there's this class of compounds, aldehyde dehydrogenases, which are, which are uh, most well known by people who have ever had a hangover. Um, if you don't know that connection, uh, make sure you ask uh, Vasilis. I know people don't drink at Yale, I'm sure, so you probably never had hangover, but those of you who heard about hangovers, uh, you can talk to Vasilis. It's, it's due to blockade of, uh, or, or exhaustion of the capacity of a certain hydrogenase. But there's, it turns out there's a big family of these enzymes, and most of them have never been drugged. 
And so he came to us uh, with this idea that, gosh, you know, there's, there's lots of therapeutic indications that these uh, that compounds that are made against these enzymes might have. And he had a tremendous amount of biology uh, in cancer and stem cell uh, uh, renewal, all kinds of other things, uh, but uh, didn't know uh, how to even start to make a drug against this. Now, our folks uh, couldn't spell aldehyde dehydrogenase, I'm quite convinced. Uh, they may still not be able to spell aldehyde dehydrogenase, uh, but that's okay because the team together uh, developed an assay, did a screen across hundreds of thousands of compounds, did several years of medicinal chemistry, all kinds of follow-up biology, still are working together. And what I'm showing you here, without going into the details, uh, is the most recent, one of the most recent compounds that was published in JMedChem. Uh, and these are all uh, the medicinal properties which have been imputed on this compound so that we can begin testing uh, in animals and eventually in humans. So this story has been repeated over and over and over again uh, in the last few years, and I hope you'll, you'll think about this for your own area. Um, if let's say you get to the point where we are pretty much with bacillus now, so you, you've gotten through this stage now, you start with a target, uh, you've got either a repurposed drug or a lead, uh, then what do you do? For most uh, uh, rare diseases, you're going to have to take it at least to an IND, if not in uh, clinical trials, uh, to be attractive to a biopharma. And so there's two programs that we have, are, which are collaborative programs, Trend and Bridges. Uh, they're somewhat different. So Trend, um, in order to get into, so the, the model is still is the same. In each case, collaboration with, between NCATS researchers and an external lab, uh, form a joint project team. It's not a grant mechanism. The money gets given to the joint project team, and they decide how to spend the resources, and it's all go, no-go decisions, milestone-driven. Um, this project goes from a probe stage to IND enabling where, to the, or to the point where an external organization, usually a biopharma, uh, will, uh, will adopt it uh, for, uh, for further development. Um, uh, in, in order to get into this program, uh, you have to be either a rare disease as defined by the Orphan Drug Act or a, or a neglected disease as defined by the WHO. Um, in Bridges, um, it's a slightly different program if you just go back to this. Uh, it, it only, Bridges only works in the preclinical IND enabling stage, so it really depends on what your need is. Uh, Bridges is really a bridging a gap problem, where a, a program, whereas Trend is really a soup to nuts program going all the way from lead up uh, into, into clinical trials. Um, and, and these are the areas that uh, these programs do. And, and I'm guessing that some of these words uh, may not even be familiar to you. And that's actually the point, um, because these are things which are, are the bread and butter, say, of a pharmaceutical organization, but are just things that are very difficult or impossible to do in an academic setting. It's very hard to get R01 funding, for instance, to do most of these things. Um, this is the current portfolio. I, the only thing I want you to, trend portfolio, and the only thing I want you to take a, away from this is that uh, very broad therapeutic areas, everything from lung disease to muscle disease to, uh, uh, to endocrine disease, uh, neurodegenerative disease, et cetera, about half of them are uh, academics and half are biotechs. Um, the reason we go across all of these disease areas is because, remember, we're trying to figure out what the general principles are. And in order to say that you have general principles, you've got to work across therapeutic areas, or else by definition you can't say they're general. Uh, here's a cancer example. This is something called core, bi uh, core binding factor CBF leukemia. It's a, um, it's a translocation form of leukemia. Think about uh, you know, Philadelphia chromosome CML. It's that sort of model. Uh, but of course, different, different proteins, different, disease, different genes, different disease. Um, this happens to be an, an intramural investigator at the Genome Institute. Uh, and, and in this case, he came to us with this compound that was actually a, an old Roche compound that, uh, that we actually developed, we actually discovered with him in a, in a high throughput screen. Um, and it turned out to not be suitable because it had, didn't have a good safety profile uh, for, uh, for pharma. Or for, for a pharmaceutical compound. So we're now doing a, about, uh, probably it'll turn out to be about two years of lead op uh, to make a suitable compound. So this is a, this is a disorder which is quite a rare disorder. There's no way that a pharma would take this on. But I think if we can get it to the point where, uh, where there's safety and efficacy, initial safety and efficacy in the humans, um, uh, our experience is that yes, far, a biotech or a pharma will take these on. Um, in the Bridges portfolio, and again, this is all online, you can see this, but there's uh, is, is about one out of ten of them are cancer projects, um, but we don't have, this has to be a pancreatic cancer uh, um, paclitaxel formulation uh, microspheres project. But um, the, the point being that we don't, we don't decide, uh, we, don't, we don't have particular diseases that we work on. We take whatever the best science is, um, and we, we look particularly for projects which are, which, which are a new kind of technology, something which is going to tell us something general about the process. 
Um, just some statistics in this part of the organization. We've reviewed about 500 proposals, taken 60. Um, uh, there's 28 that are still active. Uh, of those, uh, 20 of them uh, have graduated and been uh, uh, licensed, acquired, or raised funding, and so are out. Um, and uh, 24 INDs uh, out of 28 projects. So, so it's a very, very successful project. We actually published in, uh, in Science Translational Medicine last uh, January the success rates and uh, costs for this, these programs, and they're quite a bit under uh, the costs are quite a bit under and the success rates are quite a bit higher than the industry standard. Telling you that E-Rooms law is not immutable, it, it really is solvable, but it, it has to be approached in this different way. Uh, there is a solicitation that's open right now, so if you go to our website, uh, you, can, you can get all the information about it. It'll connect you with people for if, that you should talk to before you apply. Because this is officially an intramural program and you don't get money, the best news is here, you don't get money in a grant, you get money put in a, a joint pot that you then co-manage with the NCATS people. It is a five-page proposal. That is five. It's not 5,000, it's a five-page proposal. Now, granted, if you get through this initial stage, you're gonna get raked over by the coals, raked over the coals by the staff, you know, in terms of the, the, whether the, the data are, are good, um, but it's a much, much faster process than the usual grant process. So I just want to finish uh, with this. This is a, an example of the, the re-engineering of the whole process we're doing. So you're all aware that, um, that, that uh, uh, most drugs fail uh, in before they get to people or when they're in people uh, because either because of unanticipated toxicity that is that you test in an animal doesn't show toxicity you test in a human it does show toxicity or you test in an animal for efficacy cancer is a great example shows great efficacy in the animal you go into people doesn't do anything and and so uh, both of these uh, one could lay at the feet or the paws if you will of the animal model and so one of our concepts of how to solve this is, well, you know, what we really want to do is test on the ultimate model organism, which is the human. But we can't test on intact humans, but, but using the technologies that are available today, stem cells, tissue printing, microfluidics, uh, uh, biosensors, could we bring all these together to form multicellular organoids that would, uh, that would represent the, uh, the critical structural and functional elements of all human organs and thereby do testing on human organoids instead of going into, hu into, uh, into animals. So that's what we're doing in this program. It's a collaborative program with DARPA and the FDA. These are the, com these are the, uh, the, the tissues which we're modeling. Uh, they have to be structurally and functionally correct and alive for at least a month. Uh, and those of you who do um, uh, uh, tissue culture know how challenging that is. Um, so this is, this is about halfway through the program now. Uh, this is developing individual organs. We're now putting the organs together. There's a really nice video on our website on this one. Uh, and yes, this individual uh, is named Chip. Sorry about that, uh, but we thought that was the best name. Uh, and if you click on any of Chip's uh, uh, organs here, uh, he'll, it'll take you to the description of the individual platform. And this is how they're put together, and I hope you'll think about this from a cancer standpoint where this is advanced quite nicely. Um, if, if you take a scaffold of ECM, you add uh, usually stem cells or primary cells. You sometimes have to give them a structure, but sometimes they take on that structure by themselves. Uh, so they have to have the right spatial and temporal patterning. They often have to be perfused, because remember they have to be alive for a month. Um, they have to be in the right bioreactor to keep them alive for a month. They often have to be innervated. Uh, um, so for instance, we have a gut on a chip that actually is innervated with enteric nervous system um, uh, uh, cells and neurons and actually peristalsis, the gut peristalsis on the chip. Uh, it's quite nausea inducing actually. Um, uh, it has to have, have to, often have to have a host response important for toxicities and cancer of course. Uh, there has to be a functional readout that's non-destructive and then there has to be a computational design that allows you to gather all the data. Uh, and so this is, these are all the projects. They're, 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 most of them were done by this, this uh, flower petal model of all these academic investigators that do different organs. Uh, DARPA is funding two platforms at the VEAS and MIT. They're doing the engineering and there's a bunch of biotech industry partnerships uh, as well. Um, one of the models in cancer uh, is looking, is trying to model um, not only a, um, uh, not only a, a multicellular organoid uh, with different cell types, but also to perfuse that uh, as well. Uh, and this is what the, the, the cancer model looks like. It's actually uh, hooked up to cardiac tissue, so it actually perfuses out of an artificial, um, uh, an artificial heart. And if you go to, uh, if I can make this work, 
um, what you'll see here, these are actually uh, blood vessels uh, made from IPS cells. And what you're looking at here uh, is a, or, or these, these are uh, blood cells that are going through here and will go through this microvasculature. And then this is taking this microvasculature and, and uh, having it grow into uh, an artificial colon tumor uh, and being able to look at the delivery of chemotherapeutic agents via this microvasculature in response to this tumor in the middle. Um, where we are now is trying to put uh, all these organs together. We're trying to get all 10 of the organs on a, on a single microfluidic platform. So this is requiring uh, sort of different level of teamwork. And the goal here um, over the next two or three years is not only to go so that we have individual tissues and we're, or individual organs, we're really pretty much there already uh, in many cases. It's to uh, hook all these together so that, for instance, one might be able to put in blood and uh, a compound in artificial blood gets absorbed or not from this artificial intestine, goes to the artificial liver, gets absorbed, gets uh, metabolized or not, goes to the artificial kidney and gets and causes necrosis or not. Uh, and you can sample, do LCMS on any of the uh, uh, ports here on any of this uh, this uh, this integrated chip, but also remember these are made from IPS cells, and so what this means is that we could make one of these chips for any of these organs for each person in this room, right? So this fundamentally changes the way you think about how you assess toxicity. You don't have to do it on a on a generic mouse or a generic rat or it's transgenic or you you can you can test this in an individual person. So then you can look at individu individual variability and toxicity and efficacy responses. Um, believe it or not, we are starting to plan a comparison clinical trial that we're going to do with the CTSA program where we're going to take an intervention, a drug, give it to all these people, and then we're going to make chips out of all those people, and we're going we're to look at the response on the chip and see whether the response on the chip mirrors what we see in the people. Now, if you said that I was going to be standing here and telling you this five years ago, I, I would have told you you were nuts. But this is, this is reality already. Um, and, yeah. and so I hope what I've given you is a sense of <clears throat> that, and sorry, I just want to show you um, uh, the more information, uh, that you know, I started out with, with some really daunting problems. You know, e rooms law, the thousands of diseases that have no treatment, uh, the, the scientific issues, the empiricism, the cultural problems. But then I hope what I've shown you is that given a different paradigm, a different way of doing business, we can make rapid headway in multiple, multiple areas. But it relies not on, on NCATS just doing its thing. This only works when you think about it as a team sport. And so I think, I hope you'll think about that both within Yale. Uh, and amongst all the cancer centers, but also with us uh, individually, uh, so that we can deliver on the promise of, of, of fundamental science for the patients that are in need. So I, I know we may be short of time. I'm glad to take any questions if you have any.